Ah, exciting! Hello everyone, thank you all for being here, uh, both in person but also online. I think we've got quite a crowd everywhere, so it's really good. Uh, my name is Anna Decker, I am um, a professor at the moment, assistant professor of media studies, archival and information studies and cultural analytics at the University of Amsterdam and also um, uh, teaching at the Centre for the Networked uh, Image in London South Bank University. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's um, discussion with uh, Melanie Bordiano's Kinship and Jonas Lund on online dating with a twist. And while preparing this, um, this moderation, in a way, I was thinking like, wow, I must be the, the worst uh, moderator uh, to be asking uh, to do this, because I've been in touch with Impact for quite some time. And um, I actually met my current partner here uh, many years ago, so I, I don't know what to do with online dating whatsoever. I've never really done online dating. So maybe it's actually really good to be here and to learn a bit more on, on my uh, next adventures. So <laughs> I will uh, be shortly introducing our first um, speakers, uh, Melanie Briano and Skinship. Melanie Briano is uh, a queer Dutch artist, filmmaker, sexological body worker, somatic sex coach, educator, cuddle workshop facilitator and activist. Through their videos, performances, photographs and installations, Mel examines current conundrums of coexistence in a crippling capitalistic systems and address themes of eroding intimacy and isolation in an increasingly sterile technology world. They research how these technology advances and commodity-based pleasures increase feeling of alienation, removing a sense of belonging in an individual, and their works present anti-capitalism methods to reconnect, explore sexualities, intimacies, and feelings. Through their videos, performances, photographs, installations, they study objects, subjects related to how technical advances and commodity-based pleasures increase feelings of alienation, alienation, removing a sense of belonging in an individual, captivated by concepts of the divine, Boyana, Bonayo, sorry, explore the spiritual emptiness of their generation. Examine people's shifting relationships with nature and try to understand existential questions by reflecting on domestic situations, ideas around classification, concepts of home, gender and attitudes towards value. So I'll wrap it up a little bit, because there's too much to go on, I think, because there's so many things that uh, you have done. Now, together with uh, Skinship, they made the first online project. I think it's the first one that you've been doing now. And Skinship, uh, to give you a bit of information, is based in Berlin, a collective. And they describe themselves as a touch-based place for kinship, centering queer, trans, non-binary, intersex, agend agender, gender fluids and femme bodies creating safe, safer spaces through embodied art and activism. They organize different events from queer yoga to a 20-day workshop or perhaps challenge of self-pleasure. So together now they created this participatory dating show for queers and the respectful curious beyond the binary to hopefully answer the question how to put the body online. The floor is yours. Hi, we're Skinship, I'm Melanie Dadam, this is Ayo, hey, my name is Ayo, and this is Pa. Hello everyone, my name is Pa, um, I also go by Dadam. What do you want to know from us? <laughs> <laughs> we're very curious to hear more indeed about, well, what's your online dating show like? What can we expect? Could you tell us a little bit? 
Yeah, our online dating show is based on an event that we did last year called the 21 Days of Self-Pleasure, a queer pagan advent calendar from World AIDS Day to um, Winter, Solstice. Winter Solstice. And uh, this was a um, tutorial that we did online in which people were uh, guided by audio messages to come more into a space of self-pleasure. It was like the X lockdown. And um, within a very short um, time span of promotion, we reached a global community of 400 people. And we, we had an online group and there was lots of communication and lots of people sharing about uh, their relationship to their body, to self, to intimacy, to, to their pleasure and uh, what they were learning. And from that group, there was a need to stay together and from that came the idea of having like a dating group, a dating show, an app in which people could practice the skills and tools that we offer in our community, in our, in our space and in our, the lineage that we work in from somatic sex coaches and sexuological body workers. So um, maybe you want to add something to that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to share a bit about what uh, exactly what people got from that and also myself what I, I explored in that way because of course it's also new for us to do this work um, online uh, so so the realization of, of going into the body with oneself in a community where you know the intention of being with more people in a group online internationally was actually a really strong uh, and intimate experience because this space of going into your intimacy with yourself actually expanded a lot in, in ways that hadn't been possible before. Um, and people reported back of having this very deep uh, journey. Uh, for some people very healing, for some people very like expansive. Um, and the feeling of being together in a time where it was like a pandemic and everything was shut down. And that was amazing. That was really cool. It was also Christmas and people yeah. weren't able to visit family. So there was a lot of loneliness. And uh, also we wanted to specifically make uh, our practices like very uh, queer inclusive. So being inclusive for people who <coughs> don't uh, identify a cisgender, but also a, a diversity of people on the gender spectrum and be very political uh, in our expressions around sexuality. And also we wanted to reclaim the advent calendar away from some like cheesy chocolate and bring sex back on the spiritual page. I think what I would like to also add that we provided a variety of different practices that were recorded in a form of uh, yeah, audio recordings. These were guided practices for, uh, for all the participants. And those were um, enabling people to come in a compassionate, um, intimate connection with themselves, to explore their bodies um, in a, in a, in a uh, environment of their of the homes uh, in, a, in a safe way. Um, these were different um, uh, mini mini workshops, mini tutorials on um, uh, exploring different uh, massage techniques and um, exploring uh, also uh, our relationship to to grief and shame and uh, whatever uh, whichever emotions else may come for us when we engage ourselves consciously with the subject of our sexuality. So in a way that um, this entire uh, material that we provided with people also enabled them with um, Mm, asking themselves questions: Where, 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 where are we in our um, development as sex, uh, as sexual beings? And uh, in a way, providing practices that could also uh, let us further uh, develop into our uh, fullest potential as as sexual beings. Yeah. So there were also different tools in terms of relating to like breathing and also different. 
uh, ways of touching your own genitals or your anus and being very body explorative exploring different types of touch but also we had like how to be intimate with a hot potato and how to build your own dark room so it was a variety of like um, inputs that people got we also had a sex magic um, day and so it was really like an arch Want to join? <laughs> is there any potato? Is there a specific potato that you were looking for? <laughs> yeah, no, the potato. Uh, that was the best one. Really. Yeah. <laughs> hot, bo hot boiled potato. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. A little <laughs> produce. Yeah, I can totally imagine that. Now I have actually uh, listened to some of the um, of the uh, yeah the the trips that you actually uh, take in a way, and I thought that was really relaxing and it was really nice. I really liked it. So how, how did it end up now into this uh, skinship dating show? What, what is the difference, you would say? Well, the difference is that people actually will have a chance to practice certain practices uh, online and have an opportunity to, uh, to uh, meet other people and practice them together. Also, we, we give like containers through which uh, you can have interactions with strangers that are maybe not like based on any kind of normative interactions that you usually go through the format when you meet a stranger, especially in like dating situations or any dating. But we offer a way to like build a container, like a, like a new culture for that moment through which you both uh, through an act of consent, meaning like agreement, can like uh, proceed in uh, in a specific set of rules, which doesn't have to uh, relate to the usual codes through which we um, interact with people. So, for example, it could be like maybe you you actually wanna wanna take this. Uh, we can do a touch experience. Yeah. So. My, my role, for example, tonight will be um, to teach people more. Uh, of course, if people already was in the online uh, exploration, they also know some, but to meet each other in some of those exercises. And my role will be to touch on consent and how we can, and how to make consent and negotiation and how to talk about touch and desires and boundaries in a way that feels very... Uh, opening and, and getting to know each other and coming closer to each other uh, instead of yeah so, so so this is also one of our aims is really to create and uh, contribute to a consent culture that is I think being built slowly now in, in the world more and more and it's definitely a, a work that I find really important and so we will, and, and, and those things, it comes really down to practice and that it can be very simple practices that we can do in, in one hour. There's so many things to do where we can play and have fun with that and be like, oh, if I ask you this question, that actually shapes my possibilities of getting closer to you in a way that I want and you want at the same time. And and it can really expand this kind of level of connection um, because it's uh, yeah exploring what is possible instead of exploring uh, what is not possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also not making any assumptions, but really mm -hmm. making sure that everybody gets that consent means an agreement and not like someone giving permission to do something to someone else and I think this is a general a big mistake you know you arrive at consent together so that also means that in a space of consent everybody respects a no and it's not taken personal it's actually being celebrated just as much as an enthusiastic yes and also not feeling shame about asking for something because you know the other people stays within their own center and gives their consent to a yes or an authentic no, and um, and that gives also possibility to ask for something that you maybe feel shame about, you know, because you know the other person will give also their authentic yes or their authentic no, and doesn't go into a no against themselves while saying a yes to you because they're conditioned to please. Mm 
or want to feel safe or have a number of other reasons to say yes while they actually mean no. Could you say something more about these? I mean, you talk indeed about specific kind of rules and codes and, and the level of consent, and it all has to do, of course, with trust. But how do you indeed uh, make that happen? I mean, how do people know where are the boundaries? They ask. <laughs> this is really the it's very main... simple. It's very simple. It, 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 it really, it, it sounds very simple, like when you ask like that and I answer, people ask each other. It really comes down to that. If you are in doubt, you ask and clarify. And of course, that's super difficult for many of us who are growing up in a culture where we have not been uh, taught how to do that, how to ask for what we want ourselves, or even the layer deeper, how to feel into what I want. Mm -hmm. How can I know what I actually want if I've never explored that in a way where I, I, I explore and I play and I make mistakes and I get the space to actually uh, be in this kind of teaching level with myself or someone else. So that's the first stage we, we practice. How does it feel in the body? to know what I want and what I don't want. And then comes the second space where we learn how to voice that, um, how to ask for what I want, how to... And, and then on top of that is, of course, all the emotions of what happens if I get rejected, uh, what comes up in me, and with the fear of rejection or I even the fear of getting what I want, that can also be really scary. <laughs> So there's so many layers of, of consent that we can only explore if we allow ourselves to go there. Um, and most often what happens is that we go there and then we overwrite all of those signs and then we end in a space where it's like, oh, I, I feel, I, I, I say okay to something, but I actually am not checking in with myself and then I might be ending up in a place where I say yes to something that I don't want. Um, so yeah, we do it by games and, and we really take, we go really slow and take into considerations of all the layers and give everything opportunity to come forward because we are in a practice play space. We are not in a space where we actually want to go into kind of deep sexual orgasmic experiences. That's not our first aim. Our aim is to really expand what is in between now and 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 uh, wherever the the goal is because there is that that space is so rich. Mm. There's something else also that I would like to share. Uh, it's also an important part of the work that we do is to um, provide people in those uh, in those workshops with a set of skills that allows them to um, come into a place of safety within the nervous system so um, that also people can uh, expand their um, sensory receptivity and through um, through with, with those different practices that we can uh, enter a, a safe and grounded uh, state within our nervous system and that's also what I mentioned allows us to have much more of a connection to our own body and um, we gain all this access to all this internal bodily information. And that is very important for uh, making those agreements. This, in, this bodily information is very important for making informed choices and, and finding then ways how we communicate about that, what is present within us, what is alive and what is within us. So these are also, this is, this is entire process uh, and um, that's also part of our, our work to provide people with those tools and micro skills of how to um, of how to enter the safety within within themselves and uh, that enables us also to engage each other, with each other on in a, in a in a social way to um, to um, to have an eye to form a connection to um, expand trust and uh, 
uh, and uh, yeah, the containers then can uh, um, within the container uh, people can also uh, gradually unfold. So I have a short question indeed before we go over to Jonas, and then we'll have more uh, dialogue indeed at the end. Um, there's there's in the, on the website it says that there's different hosts. And um, could you say something about the hosts? What, who are the hosts? What do they do? And uh, what do they signify? Okay. So tonight <laughs> you're going to meet me as the pleasure oracle. And um, we're going to tap into the pleasure body and we're going to connect with the inner erotic self. And um, by doing so, um, we're going to explore and... Uh, we're going to develop the um, erotic body language, which uh, I believe um, can be also used as a tool for pursuing our wishes and desires. So uh, this, this erotic body language can be also our seductive language. So that's what we're going to explore um, in, uh, in my room. Uh, and um, also coming into... Uh, contact with pleasure and, and, and the transformative force of pleasure as this can also um, um, help in, in my personal journey connecting with, with pleasure and, and, and working with, uh, with, with self-pleasure, with self-touch has been um, supporting me in my journey of overcoming uh, my um, harsh judgment about my 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 body and my and my body dysphoria um, so in a way um, tapping into that pleasure can also um, help us form a much more loving and compassionate connection with our own bodies and from there having that compassionate and loving connection to ourselves, having this connection to our own body and our own pleasure, this is a place where we can start opening up to others. And those not necessarily have to be other human beings, those can be also plants, those can be um, objects, animals, we can uh, allow ourselves for our authentic erotic self-expression and that must, that that does not necessarily have to be addressed to another human being. We can explore uh, ourselves as sexual beings regardless of having someone, uh, a human, another human being to address it to. So um, that's what we're going to explore in my room. You're all very welcome to join. I would say sign up people because there's still some places available. Now I also get some feedback, but I think yeah, and then we're good here. Um, yeah, one one room will be how to talk to your date from your anus, and uh, one room will be about like a mashup identity uh, dress up party, and uh, how to be your authentic self. One room will be like about how to create your uh, uh, your your unapologetic uh, dating profiles and what comes up with. The like dating online and then we have the concentrics here with uh, touch touch based consent games and um, and there will be a main hall and we're also still developing this and uh, dealing with the uh, with the complexity of it online so it's our first installment and uh, we're really uh, looking forward to see you all and also for your feedback and we hope to do it also again Great, we'll continue the discussion uh, in a minute, uh, but before we go there, um, I'd like to introduce you also to Jonas Lund, who is also in a similar but very different way, I think, uh, concerned indeed with the, the ideas of trust. Um, I've known Jonas uh, quite some time already, and so I've been tracing a little bit like, okay, where is this coming from, this new work, one-on-one -on -one plus one. So he has already indeed quite an impressive body of work in which he's been doing a lot of performative uh, projects online. I think it started about 10 years ago with uh, self-surfing in which uh, someone could follow your browser movements, right? 
And he expanded in following also his live social media and email uh, behavior in uh, public access me. So we could get a real good insight in, in Jonas's online behavior. But these were very much sort of durational works involving an intense commitment from Jonas, of course, over a concentrated period of time, in which he was also opening and free sharing all the information to the uh, online audiences. And so that kind of developed in subsequent works, and he emerged also an interest between public and private. Well, that kind of makes sense, indeed, when showing all your private stuff there. So, but he was also now trying to include the audience more and more, I think, right? In particular, in we see in every direction, but even more so in uh, gallery analytics, where he started also blurring, in a way, the line between visible interaction uh, but also surveillance tracking by tracing the different uh, Wi-Fi connections, for example, within the gallery uh, in an attempt to, in a way, analyze also the visitors' movement in the space and from that distill, actually, also how well the works in the exhibition performed. Now, finally, in a way, it comes to the present, and I think it started about a year ago or so, in the very recent past, in a way, in which you are focusing now much more on the conversational chat box ideas. Uh, first in the project Talk To Me, where you were initially a performer, and a bot learns your conversation skills through all the kind of online things that you, that you use, from Skype conversations, etc. And then they kind of use that to generate a discussion, discussion between yourselves, basically, you and you. Uh, which is a nice uh, uh, discussion coming up there. And again, that kind of developed more and more into advanced systems, such as the friendly advice that was uh, taking place earlier this year, in which anyone could book a conversation slot with you. And um, what it says indeed is like the response and advice, etc., became um, more analytic, uh, your responses particularly, and which you could become more of a socially empathetic kind of uh, yeah talkative partner in a way. So we'll see indeed how how uh, in how his social skills have improved uh, in a minute. So today you will tell us more about the next level one on one plus one. Uh, hi, thank you so much for the introduction, and hi everybody, and thanks for coming, and thanks for inviting me, and thanks to everybody. Uh, I have prepared a presentation, uh, just before starting it, I just wanted to say one, two words so you can be slightly more prepared as to what's going to happen. Uh, so I, for the impact as a commission, I made one on one plus one, which is a startup, it's a dating platform. And I prepared a presentation modeled after Y Combinator, uh, y Combinator's pitch deck. Y Combinator is a venture capitalist fund in Silicon Valley that were very early investors in Dropbox and Uber, to name a few. Every year they have like Y Combinator where they invite startups to pitch and then you can get like starting capital, seed funding. Right? So I made a presentation modeled after their structure, which involves something like an intro, which involves the problem, the solution, the traction, the market, the vision and the team. So what I would like to invite you to do for this presentation is to imagine that you are a venture capitalist. You sit on a budget of, you sit of a, like a pool of money at around one billion dollars or more and you're looking for businesses to invest in. Uh, yes, uh, we can switch to the presentation, I believe. Yeah, uh, yeah. Struggling to choose new people, then you can Introducing one-on-one -on -one an automatic algorithm-based software that pairs you up with your new best friend, lover, or partner in crime. All you have to do is provide your name, social media profiles, and email address. One-on-one -on -one plus one will automatically pair you up with the best match for you, based on publicly available information. And once you find that special someone, one-on-one -on -one plus one invites the both of you to a video chat where you can interact with one another and have an enjoyable first meeting. Not just that, our video meetings are watched over by a range of performance-enhancing algorithms that monitor the meeting and suggest things to say, topics to discuss, and simply nudge the both of you to have a productive and wonderful first encounter. So sign up today to take your social life to the next level. One-on-one -on -one plus one. Uh, yeah, one-on-one -on -one plus one. The pitch is automatic do-nothing matchmaking. Um, the problem, meeting people is hard. 
Dating apps require a lot of work. People are lazy, people are not truthful, and people don't know what to say. We can all recognize these problems, right? This is all correct and true. The solution, this here's a slide of lonely people. Here's the data that backs up that a lot of people are indeed very lonely. And it's something that we notice just increases. More people feel more lonely. And we also know that loneliness leads to depression and it's very negative for your health. Dating apps require a lot of work. Online dating takes effort and effort equals time. Tinder founder Sean Rad's top tips for the perfect profile. 11 ways to upgrade, upgrade the hell out of your Tinder profile. It's just a lot of work. People, we are lazy, yeah? we don't want to do anything. Slide of, slide of proof that you lie about yourself. It's become very obvious and very, uh, uh, yeah, obvious, let's say, that when you are asked to present yourself, you are not always truthful. You say that you are taller than you are, you say that perhaps you are more funny than you are. And this is the sort of quintessential problem with dating platforms that if it ba is based on you uh, presenting yourself to another and you are the curator of this presentation, it will not be a truthful image of who you actually are. We also don't really know what to say usually in conversations. I think awkwardness is kind of underestimated in terms of social interaction. Hmm. The solution, automatic, do nothing matchmaking. The automatic matchmaking works by you having, all you have to do is sign up with a name and an email address. That's it. And the publicly available information gives us a much more accurate picture about you than yourself. And it's a zero effort kind of thing. It's uh, analyzing and looking at all the different traces you leave online as you do everything you do when you go about your day. Every picture you post on Instagram, every tweet you tweet, every TikTok you like, etc. The matching algorithm scans all available information about you, relying on a vast array of OSINT tools, open source intelligence, most typically used by private detectives to do research on you. We also have match curators, workers trained in finding the special connecting connection between two people. The relative ease of training ensures rapid growth potential. So, okay, so that's the first problem solved. The first couple of problems, we can match you and you don't have to do anything. The fifth problem where you don't know what to say, we have a solution for this too, and that is coached first meetings. The meeting, the application invites you to a video chat. And then in this video chat, you get to interact with each other and with plus one, which is the automatic process that coaches you. It uh, suggests things to say, here it says, uh, an app mysteriously appears on your phone that does something amazing. What does it do? And then you can ask your partner this, and then you instantly have a conversation topic. It also coaches you uh, if you're talking too much or too little. Here it's letting me know I'm on the left, although I'm anonymous for privacy. Yeah? You're t I'm talking more than my partner. And that might be a good thing or it might be a bad thing. We don't really know. But in fact, it's quite useful to know this happens. Right? If you talk, 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 and you don't listen, that might be a problem. It also augments conversations. Every time you mention a certain topic, it can also augment the conversation with the latest news items. Here, someone mentioned Netflix. Squid Game documents may show how Netflix rates the success of its content pops up. And then automatically, you can just uh, pivot the conversation to Squid Game because who hasn't seen Squid Game? Yeah. It also entertains, it's like uh, if uh, you, it listens basically, it listens in on the conversation and then pops up sort of emojis to augment. Yeah. It also moderates the conversation. Should you mention something like uh, uh, Trump, conspiracy, fake news, etc., it will pop up a little notice saying political topic detected, proceed with caution. There's also a range of trigger words. Trying, it's trying to steer the conversation to happy places and avoid negative places. Right? Trigger word detected, pandemic, proceed with caution. There's more. Quantified meetings. Everything you say and all your emotions gets quantified, measured, put into a database that we can use for monetization. Every time someone mentions something in the line of, ooh, I'm really thirsty, ooh, I could use a drink, we can then automatically place advertisement that matches your desire. Here you see a sponsored content Coca-Cola ad from someone mentioning they're thirsty. 
We also have sponsored talks, sponsored meetings. This meeting is sponsored by Squarespace. Uh, this is the classic monetization solution, because we know everything about you, everything you say and your emotional reaction. So we can also quantify the result of the advertising, advertisement afterwards. Does it spark joy or does it produce frustration? Solution. This is a common problem in dating apps. It's like if you tune the algorithms too much to create long-lasting relationships, you lose customers. The solution, tune the matching algorithm to create short-lasting relationships or make the users reliant on the plus one coach for their success. Similar to how people get addicted to psychoanalysis, we can addict people to the plus one coach. Okay, traction. Since the launch last week, we had a 1,300% growth and already created 13 successful matches. The market of dating platforms today is unreal. 2020, it was a $3.5 billion market. 250 million users. 44.5 billion valuation of Tinder. That is crazy. And the global, this is the projected growth, uh, the projected growth of 2025 is 6 billion annual revenue, annual profits, it's crazy. Competition, Tinder, Badu, Tantan, Bumble, Match.com, Plenty of Fish and Hinge, US dating app market share, Tinder has 7.8 million, Bumble 5.5 million. The true competitor in this space, it's Match Group. This is the company that owns Match.com, it owns Hinge, it owns OkCupid, it owns Tinder, and it owns uh, 45 other dating services. The market, number of single person households in the Netherlands from 2029 20, to 2020 by gender, I believe it's around 3 million singles in the Netherlands. That's 3 million potential users. The vision, automatic do-nothing matchmaking leads to no more lonely people, no more sadness, more productivity, more kids, more love. Yeah. And uh, yes, we, we end with the team, which is me. It's a, I'm a sole entrepreneur, visionary of one on one plus one. So sign up today and uh, like find the next match. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good. Thank you so much, Jonas. Uh, that's going to be Thanks. Uh, quite a different uh, take in a way, right? Yeah. From what we just heard. I mean, where do you yeah. see trust coming in in your project? I mean, I think uh, so uh, it's, it has like a, a duality to it, right? There's a pitch and it's presenting to do something. And then there's like the darkness of all the consequences of what it is. It's a sort of future prediction dystopia of where it's going like what's the next dating platform, like where everything about you gets quantified in a way where you have zero agency and zero consent really as to what the profile makes up. And then this gets quantified and put into magic algorithm, magic decision making to produce matches. It's a sort of endless, it's a sort of end, uh, end location for engineering uh, relationships. Right? And I think there's been a lot of conversation previously about Tinder in the way Tinder engineers the future generation of, of humans. That like something, I think around in around five, 10 years, something like 10 to 15% of all kids being born in the Western part of the world will be the result of a Tinder matching algorithm. Which is kind of interesting to think about what that does. Right? In this case, the trust is a tricky one. <laughs> like, if I will ask myself, would I trust such a startup? Like, I would never trust such a startup <laughs> to do what it pr uh, presents itself to do. Right? It's a very dubious proposition, I think. In particular, because it comes from myself, and I always tend to bend sort of rules or present something as something and then do something else. Mm. Nevertheless, like, I talked to some people yesterday that were part of the or, um, first matches, and they talked very positively about these encounters. So I think there is a certain duality to it where it may also actually lead to uh, creating new relationships mm -hmm. in a way that chat roulette also can lead to creating new relationships in a serendipitous kind of mm -hmm. uh, production. Yeah. yeah, maybe even here um, tonight we can see new relations coming up as well. Indeed. Who knows? Yes.
Um, I want to open up also indeed to the audience, so if we could just uh, have some more light so I can see you. And also, of course, we've got online questions and possibilities there as well, which I'm tracking here. Uh, thanks to the nice uh, moderators upstairs as well. So do, do pose your questions. And we also have this uh, beautiful game, which is actually quite a good matchmaking uh, game, I think, as well, um, sort of. Well, you'll get that if you start to uh, question, uh, pose a question. In the meantime, I do have, of course, other questions as well. I mean, what I think is, uh, yeah, it's, it's your projects in a way are, are touching upon two extremes, right? It's, there's the one is much more personal, it seems to me, but then maybe I'm really old-fashioned, and the other one seems much more quantified, indeed, in a sense. What is, what is really striking to me, though, within both your projects is that idea of fun. There, there is a sort of funny kind of game playfulness in there as well. How do you both see that? And perhaps in your own work, in your own projects, but also from the other one? Or maybe you don't see that at all. I mean, I, I see it, it's like a strategy for me in a way to, um, because if, if you try and confront all the issues with like automation, automatic decision-making, algorithmic structures, if you try and confront it head-on, it gets unbearable. It's like such an oppressive mass of technology that governs your life and society that it seems to me nearly impossible to approach that with an open mind without crumbling under depression and sadness and like what, what can you possibly do? Because mm -hmm. right? the forces are so strong. So then in a way, for me, the, the way I handle this is to, like, I mean, critique it by making fun of it or making light of it or trying to embody the sensation of what it feels like to be quantified, like, in the way. Because I think that's, like, if you can get the correct bodily reaction to a quantification that happens without your consent, right? Think of any social media platform, they quantify everything. Every little minute micro-interaction gets put into databases. Like this what Susanna Zuboff talks about in like, uh, uh, surveillance capitalism. Behavioral surplus, right? Everything you do gets put into databases that are used for decision making in the future. And then if you try and confront that head on, it's like you just like... It's, it's like trying to look at climate change with an open eye without becoming entirely depressed and inactive. So then m my strategy for doing that is to... Uh, make light of it in a way and also invite you to f to kind of get a sensation of the and the bodily feeling of the reaction towards this because i think as you do these meetings in one on one plus one to do a video meeting where you get coached by an automatic process it's very confronting like everything you say gets put into something and then things happen and it's a very uh, eerie feeling, at least for me. It feels like someone is sitting on your shoulder looking at everything you do. And I think that's the correct response to all these automatic systems. Yeah. So then I, I think that's it. But then, yeah, it's like some nuance in there, I suppose. What do you think, guys? I think next dating show we're going to make sure it's really not fun. There we go. And that everybody's really going to suffer a lot. <laughs> and see what kind of matches come out of that. Pain. One more pain. Um, I think there's really not any other way. I mean, you know, how else are you going to, like, navigate the future if it's not, like, a fully, like, a, a yes, like, and... Uh, also, I think what is kind of similar in our project that there's an aspect of randomness, you know, like you're being like uh, put maybe in a breakout room or you put, you enter a room with people, it's not like you chose to go with a bunch of friends or, you know, and then you just have to deal with it and also we propose a set of like social, um, social interactions through which you can find connection and maybe it's not an algorithm but it's also like a social algorithm that is in our bodies and just like an algorithm online just predicts the future by by collecting data and through that navigate the predictability on the future what is what is safe what what will lead to pleasure what will lead to pain so do our bodies you know, it's not really any difference, and our approach is just different because we're going to be more fun than Jonas. 
So <laughs> we're going to have a little battle here. Uh, you can let us know later. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come to yours, uh, Jonas, because I want to date the algorithm. Is it possible? For sure, yeah. I can that make sounds a really hot. Special mash, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Can you write That's a little... Uh, special mashed potato. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't know, do you have something to add? Any questions from the audience? Yes, it's going. So, we're going to. Yeah, that's a bit too far for me. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think there's sound yet, so let's see. Sound. Sound. No? Oh, the the tension here is just yeah. killing me here now. Uh, as we wait, um, so Melanie, you put us in competition with each other. Is that a good basis for love? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I <laughs> thought it was all like inclusive, <laughs> non-competitive. It's like, okay, so but I can for sure set you up with a date with the algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the microphone is making progress. Yes. Thanks. Hi. Uh, hi, Melanie. It's Katerina here. Um, I want to thank you for your wonderful project. Um, and I have a question for uh, Jonas, because you said, Jonas, that um, in the future, you know, all relationships or the majority of uh, marriages, what have you, will always uh, uh, take place or predominantly take place on Tinder, which is a daunting thought, I do agree. However, um, I don't know if you were yesterday at Natalie Dixon's presentation, uh, and I have to say, uh, Senora got me thinking about this idea of arranged marriages and about also the ads in the newspapers. Um, the ads of all these women uh, who wanted to leave Portugal for a better life uh, in South Africa. And in a way, I'm just trying to figure out, isn't it the same thing, but the media is different? Or is there something that is more different? Yeah, uh, yeah, now it's back. Uh, uh, it's like, I don't like to make predictions, let's say, for the future, but if I do, it's always really negative predictions. <laughs> and that's why I try and avoid it. So that's like the worst outcome, is that all the relationships in the future get engineered, let's say. In some way, one would imagine that in today's dating platforms, and similar to Annette, I have very next to zero experience firsthand from using uh, online dating platforms. I would imagine one has a bit more agency compared to the old newspaper ads in terms of how you choose to present yourself or how this uh, interaction happens. But it's funny, in, like, in terms of advertisement, as I was launching the one-on-one -on -one plus one, I tried to advertise it because I posted it on social media and the Instagram algorithm punishes this so hard because it detects it's about an algorithm so the Instagram algorithm protects itself from competing algorithms and shows it to nobody. So it feels like it's already a self-aware AI. Right? So then I go to the next step, okay, I have to pay money to promote this project. But you're not allowed to promote dating platforms in the Facebook uh, universe without written approval from Facebook. So you have to apply to become one of the approved dating platforms to advertise. On, so it's already a completely hyper-competitive space in terms of advertisement, which is shocking. I imagine it's because there's so much spam, like hot women in your neighborhood, like ads and stuff like that. But in principle, the essence is the same, I would say. Like, it's, an, it's like, a, here I am, right? Like, I'm, I'm available, I'm looking for somebody. Um, it's just, I, yeah, I would say it's kind of the same. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think, Melanie? You agree? Yeah, well, I, I, first of all, I also noticed that the advertisement for this dating show didn't, didn't uh, surface uh, the algorithm. And that was also shocking to me, I think, just because it said actually dating show without any kind of weird uh, spelling, it was immediately pushed down. And, um, yeah, that, that just says so much about like the power and the control of who is, who is dominating the matchmaking scene and, and through which lens those matchmakings are, uh, are being um, 
made. And in terms of, um, I didn't see the other other lecture, but I think what is the difference is the intention. So in one one form of advertisement, the intention is to leave an economic background to like like match through marriage and 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 enter a, a different economy. And in that sense, it's already very different from from making a matchmaking that is based on commenting on on the the multinationals that make matchmaking happen um, yeah that's what I have to say to it do I see another question up there or was that just hesitation of not knowing yet where to date or not there we go thank you Hi, Melanie, it's, uh, it's Arion. Um, I have a, a very practical question. Is it possible to switch between rooms in tonight's dating show? <laughs> or you have to choose at the beginning <laughs> and stick to that? You are. <laughs> no, um, you have to choose a room. That's how far we are at this moment. Uh, we're happy to develop it, but for now it's going to be quite uh, like really like one or one point oh version of it so so you choose a room for about 40 minutes then there is a there's a water in water out break and then you choose another room and then you enter again in the main room so you have two chances okay <laughs> and then maybe if i'm allowed a next question for jonas um um i mean so the information you get to make the matches is based on publicly available profiles mm -hmm in which uh, I, and probably you also, uh, lie as much as you would do in your dating profile. Um, how will your algorithms kind of deal with that? I mean, the, uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, it's true that social media is very much a curated version of yourself. But the algorithm doesn't stop at social media. It will then Google your name endlessly to dig up that post from like 1998 where you said something offensive in a forum that reveals the inner workings of your brain and then tag it, flag it, and then put it into more databases and then be like, haha, Arion, I know what you did in the 90s. Because <laughs> the internet never forgets, right? The internet never forgets. Yeah. I certainly don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can help you there. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe the next step is to then outsource it to, to actual uh, click workers that will interview friends of the matcher to see, okay, but what did he actually do in the 80s? <laughs> exactly. We're going to overrule the algorithms here. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I do have another question, actually, because I'm, I'm quite curious for all of you, really. It's like, how did these projects that you're doing actually change yourself? Mm. How do they influence your thinking about your sexuality, your dating behavior, all those kind of things? Mm. Silence is always a good thing. I mean, I, fir my first reaction is like, wow, I'm so happy I'm not single. <laughs> <laughs> Why? It's really good, I think. I was like, I was like wow, I'm so, p I'm so grateful because I, many years ago, I installed Tinder as for research because I wanted to build like a Tinder for contemporary art to like swipe left and right to make a collector's profile so you can just like quantify our, our contemporary art taste. And then I was on Tinder and I was like, well, I find the interface of Tinder completely horrific. It's really like sorting, uh, I don't know, something else. Like it's the complete commodification of people. And I'm so grateful I don't have to uh, rely on something like this to meet somebody. It's like, that's kind of, I think that's my immediate reaction to that question. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we uh, practice a certain, um, we practice in a certain lineage. So I think where where we are as social creatures is already very much outside of the of the box of any kind of like hetero or hormone normativity. Like we're all poly, so you know to have a single partner is also already not part of our uh, like subculture. And um, we organize orgy money, so intimate relationship isn't like something that we experience only within like. Ro romantic uh, connections 
and we do sex work and we also give uh, sessions that are based on teaching people around pleasure meaning that there's genital contact between our friends and our clients so the way we relate to sexuality is completely uh, um, developed uh, in which uh, in a line that is like making us um, yeah already like outside of that whole system let's say so um, it's a, it's a really, um, yeah, do you want to add to that? Because there's like opening a lot of things. Yeah, that's also what crossed my mind that um, the way we live our lives are, we're already beyond the heteronormative and cisgendered uh, standards and the, and the understanding of how, um, how relationships should be formed, uh, uh, focused also on uh, procreation and uh, and uh, centralizing the uh, family model of, of how to be in a relationship. That that's where you would uh, aim to end up having a one partner and uh, and a kid or several kids. So um, that's not our reality, and uh, therefore also we, um, our practice, uh, uh, what we practice supplies us with with tools and and skills to uh, navigate that uh, that wider complexity, uh, to and allows us to develop tools also to be. Um, um, to communicate also with each other in a in a in a direct, honest, and authentic way. To um, to prioritize uh, trust in those relationships and, and embodied connections and um, playfulness. Yes. Is there anything else you would like to add to that? No, I think it's very right. I also. Yeah, it's it's com it, it's complex, and I also think that mm, all those algorithms it's of of what we click and what we buy. I don't know. It's it feels like that there's a le level of spirituality or a, a level of humanity that I don't think the algorithms can can detect. <laughs> I really like to believe that. <laughs> uh, and I think it's also something, yeah, what happens between humans and connections, and and those things are maybe the. I think what 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 you just said is like the skills we are learning and teaching. Of course, embodying in ourselves is changing how I see and understand connection between people, and how I see I can connect with people who are, might not be my romantic partners or who I might not. Yeah, I can still connect with people on a very deep level, and I think those skills are something that humanity has to learn on a on a longer line, on a bigger scale, than actually being matched with the perfect person. Because I don't believe that, that this perfect person exists. So yeah, I think it goes maybe hand in hand with also skill development, um, mm. and that's what I learned myself the last few years. Yeah, and also note that attraction is based on the usual signifiers that we are taught by mainstream culture, but that through a process of different tools, you are actually able to like navigate your sense of sensuality with someone that you maybe don't feel this like normal attractivity to, or you know, you're in proximity to a gender that you don't normally don't end up with, and you're able to enjoy pleasure. And maybe there's a whole vocabulary out out there of different forms of sensations and pleasure that we have access to that are not popular, and that's like what we what we practice, and that comes also with like vulnerability and. Um, and a, a kind of openness that is, uh, and a kind of self-responsibility and um, uh, respect that is uh, part of a training when you enter a space like this. So when you want to enter a space like this, you get a training. You can't just like arrive there, you know, it's like a skill set. And, and that's basically what we're teaching and what we're also practicing. I have one question uh, also online, which I would like to pose, although we are very running out of time, so if you could keep your answers a bit short, that'd be great. 
But there's a question from Marika who asks regarding the skinship dating show about the competition thingy. I guess if there's casual sex and dating, it means there's competitive sex. And how would you qualify for the tournaments? Did you get that? <laughs> what is the question around the competition? Point about that. Um, yeah, she, she responds indeed to the competition thingy, but perhaps that was between you and Jonas. Uh, I guess she responds indeed, if there's casual sex and dating, it means there's competitive sex. And how would you qualify for the tournament of that competition? I don't know I, how to I, answer. <laughs> I think that there is a misunderstanding that, that there is no competition included uh, anywhere. So there is no nothing you have to kind of get. You don't have to com complete anything or, or be in a certain level of anything. It's it's really not like that. Everyone is well, very welcome, and the whole point is that we make people meet exactly where they are and make people meet uh, in in. What, where they can meet instead of imagining something where a goal or something. So the whole trick or the art is to, to come down to what, what's present in the present moment and what, what can we do together there as those humans who, who are present. Yeah. I think that's a perfect uh, question indeed, uh, answer, I mean, uh, to this question. Um, thank you very much, uh, both Jonas and Skinship. And I have to say, I learned a lot. And I think dating is actually quite fun. But it, I also found out that dating is very much about training, uh, training in different aspects, uh, both in the sort of finding trust between you and the others, and the others, both human and non-human, uh, but also training in the sense of, well, what is actually training me? Is it still um, the person behind this, or is there an algorithm? And how do I actually fool that, both of those, perhaps? But primarily what I've come to understand, that festivals are still the place to be to find your date. Thank you very much, all of you, for uh, joining us, and I hope to see you tonight. <laughs>